This video is brought to you by BoardGamePrices.com. Find the best prices for board games at BoardGamePrices.com. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to 10 Great Games for 6 Players. Now like all the lists I do, this is about my personal opinion, so the game's not on here. It could be because I haven't played it. It could be because I don't like it. The only thing you need to know is that this is mine and my opinion alone. Now 6 Players is a weird player count. It's usually way too many for any heavyweight Euro game. It's slightly too many for most dungeon crawlers, and it's not quite enough for most party games. So games like Secret Hitler, you really want eight people or so. And playing something like Caverna six players sounds like torture to me. So the games I've picked are ones I think that really shine at that six player mark. Either because it's a critical mass to make the game work, or because they rely on a lot of player interactions. But first up, let's look at some honorable mentions. The first honorable mentions are Seven Wonders and Between Two Cities. Now I really like both of these games, but they don't necessarily shine more at 6 players than they do at say 5 or 7. Another honourable mention is Magic the Gathering. Now there's a format in this game called Two Headed Giant, which I really enjoyed playing back in the day. And that was where you had two teams of three battling each other back and forth. I'd also like to bring up the Star Wars LTG at this time, because it also worked well in a Two Headed Giant format with one side having a Sith, Imperial Navy, and Scum and Villainy player matching up against a Jedi, Rebel Alliance, and Scoundrels player. Now with those out of the way, let's move on to my top 10. Number 10 is an old game, and it's one with a legendary playtime, and that's Civilization. Now Civilization's really good at six or seven players, but we found six gave you just that little bit of expansion space and wiggle room in the game. It's a serious commitment to play a game of Civilization, or the latter advanced Civilization, both will run you 6, 8, 10, 12 hours pretty easily. But there's something undeniably majestic about the game. And with 6 players, the trading element really comes into its own. You'll see stacks of iron and gold, cloth and grain traded back and forth, as well as many, many disasters. At 6 players, the disasters hit all the time, so the game is incredibly chaotic. Definitely not one I'd recommend for everyone out there, but Civilization is, arguably, one of the first Euro games ever made. And it's something I recommend everyone into gaming gives a go at least once in their life, if they can. And if they've got time. And six or seven people to play it with. And a copy of the game. Although it has been recently reprinted, so that's not as bad as it used to be. Number nine is a game all about chaos. The more players you add to this game, the more chaotic it gets, and that's Robo Rally. Now a lot of the time in Robo Rally is spent programming your actions, and then revealing them and carrying them out, as your little robots move around this factory of death, getting smashed into things, pushed onto conveyor belts, and otherwise dismantled and destroyed. The more players you add, the less likely your plans are going to come off. And I found at 5, and especially 6 players, the game just gets stupidly chaotic, and it's a lot of silly fun. With that many players, resolution of actions can take a bit of time, but each action resolution's likely to cause some chaos and flow on effects, so everyone will be captivated by what's happening on the table. This really is a hilariously fun game that you just can't take super seriously, because if you do take it too seriously, playing with six players and having your orders completely screwed up will drive you up the wall, and onto a conveyor belt, and into a pit. Number 8 is one of the party games I think actually works best at 6, and that's Codenames. And the reason I think Codenames works best at 6 is you have two teams of three, one person is giving the clues on each team, and two people are guessing. Now two's enough for you to bounce ideas off about what the clue suggestion is. It's not so much that you end up debating it like a committee, going round and round in circles for a while. With three players on each team, one giving the clue, and two guessing, you have more opportunity to get involved in the game than you do at higher player counts. It's also a remarkably affordable game that's available practically everywhere. Like I see this in bookstores all up and down New Zealand, so if it's in New Zealand bookstores, it's probably available at your local game store. Number 7 is my favourite hidden movement game, and that's Last Friday. And the reason it works well at 6 is because one player plays the killer, and there are always 5 camp counsellors in this game. You always have to play with five. So if you've only got three players, that means some people are controlling two counselors. The only two player counts that works perfectly is at six and two. And I think it's much better as a group activity. It also means that there's an investment from each person in their camp counselor. No one wants to be the one that gets thrown at the killer to slow them down. You'll end up with more arguing, 
more bickering, and more survival horror elements to the game as the killer starts moving slowly around trying to dispose of people. The other cool thing about Last Friday is it changes tempo. In most hidden movement games, the hunter and hunted don't switch. In Last Friday, it switches each chapter. So where you're running from the killer in chapter one, you're actually trying to catch the killer in chapter two. This means it's really four hidden movement games in one game. And if anyone is eliminated, they just come back in the next act of the game. So even if you are taken out, there's very little downtime and you're still involved in the overall tension of the game. Anyway, this game's quite fun at any player count, but six really is the magic number for it. Next up is a game that's really designed for eight players, but I think it works best at six, and that's Captain Sonar. Now the thing in Captain Sonar is you're supposed to have a team of four people. One is the captain who decides where the submarine goes. One is the radio operator who's listening to the other team and tracking down their path so they can figure out where they are. But the other two players are pretty much bookkeeping roles. And if that's the only thing you're doing, one of these two bookkeeping roles, it's actually not that great. If you combine the two bookkeeping roles into one player, they become a lot more busy. And that position becomes quite hectic and quite chaotic and quite tense for that person because the speed of the submarine is restricted by how fast they can do things. It makes the engineering responsibilities a lot more integral and important. And that player's role becomes as important to the submarine as the captain or the radio operator. Whereas before they're very much the third and fourth most important roles. It's also a hell of a lot easier to get six people together than it is to get eight. And Captain Sonar is a wonderfully unique game. It does have a sense of tension and a sense of wonder that few games can evoke. The real time hunting each other aspect of the game is just, it's just really well done. While it's not a game I recommend everyone goes out and buys because it just doesn't hit the table that often with that player count, it's definitely one I recommend trying out at least once to see if you like it. Next up is one of the classic diplomacy style games from a very very famous IP and that is A Game of Thrones. First or second edition it doesn't really matter. I've not played the Mother of Dragons expansion for second edition which apparently sorts some of the problems this game has at lower player counts but first edition with the expansion and second edition really work best at six players. You need Stark, Lannister, Greyjoy, Baratheon, Tyrell and Martell to be in the game. If one of them's taken out the whole balance of the game just feels off. I mean you can play it by limiting the map somewhat but it just doesn't feel right. In a game without Martell for example, House Tyrell and House Baratheon just have no pressure coming at them from the bottom. So they're free to pile in on House Lannister, which is already really exposed. And in general, as a diplomacy game, and one about alliances and making deals, it really needs that mass of players to, to work. Of course, there's the commitment that it's going to take you three, four, five hours to play this, depending on your group. And it does have the big problem of being a complete pain in the ass to teach new players. Especially as the gap between very experienced players and new players really can throw the game out. But if you have a group of comparable experience who know the game well enough and have the time and commitment to play it to the end and not walk out on turn two because their first attack fails yeah this happened it can be a really unique and rewarding experience but it's definitely not one to take lightly one person playing for shits and giggles while other players are playing to win can completely throw the balance of the game out so what i'm really saying is in the perfect scenario a game of thrones is a fantastic six player experience assembling that scenario is up to you Next up is a game most people consider one of the great games ever made, and that's Twilight Imperium 4. Twilight Imperium can work at lower player counts, but 6 seems to be its magic number. Something about the game being based entirely on hexes, probably. At 6 players, the map feels the right size. There's also a real tension about getting to Mechatol Rex first and occupying it. There's enough space for you to have two opponents on either side that you absolutely hate, but you've made deals with their three enemies. And those alliances can switch and change. It also means of the eight strategy cards, two aren't getting picked each turn. And one of the problems at four players is all of them get picked each turn, and that can make the game feel a bit off. At six players, it feels like the epic, galaxy-spanning, conquest game it's supposed to be. With that mix of diplomacy and interaction that only happens at higher player counts. And yeah, again, it's another game where you need 
a lot of people. But I find Twilight Imperium's a bit easier on the experience level than a Game of Thrones because it's more dynamic in the areas you occupy and control. And a player on their first game can still do reasonably well. As long as they understand the basics of occupying planets and building big ships, they can end up with a massive terrifying fleet by the end of the game. They might be behind in victory points because they haven't focused on that, but they can still be a threat and feel like they're contributing or feel like they're powerful. And that's one of the cool things about this game. Even if you don't play it to win super seriously and you just want to build a big fleet and go smash things, that can still feel rewarding and as though your time invested in the game was worth it. Speaking of Twilight Imperium 4, game 3 on the list is set in the Twilight Imperium universe, and that is Rex. Only kidding, it's actually June. Now for those who don't know, Rex is a reskin of the original June game, and the June game is about to be re-released for the first time in a very long time. June works exceptionally well at 6 players, not so well at the other player counts. And the reason for that is that there are 6 very distinct asymmetric factions within June that bring different things to the table. And each one that you take out lessens the game somewhat, or lessens the experience, and lessens the immersion. You need the Harkonnen and the Atreides to have the presence of troops on the ground. You need the Fremen to make the world feel like June. You need the Emperor for people to be able to pay them a huge amount of money to buy all the technology cards, so they can throw their wealth around and flaunt it. You need the Guild to make it feel like someone's ripping you off to deploy troops to the planet. And you need the Bene Gesserit because simply put, they are one of the most clever factions ever designed for a game with the most unique victory conditions in any board game. And that's that the Bene Gesserit at the start of the game can write down who's going to win and on what turn. And if they guess right, or more importantly, if they maneuver the game to the point where that comes true, they win the game alone. And that is just one of the most brilliant pieces of theme and game design coming together to create something that feels so appropriate to the Dune setting, but is also a fascinatingly unique mechanic in a game. Dune's core system might feel a little dated by today's standards, and I'm going to guess that a lot of people when they play it for the first time when the reboot comes out are going to be horrified by the combat mechanics. But it's one of those games that's a slow, tense burn all the way through of shifting alliances backstabs betrayals massive gambits that may or may not pay off and really big dramatic moments i'm really glad this game is coming out of print and and i know i disrespected rex but it has been good to at least have a version of the game in print and available for people to play over the last decade or so and while the Twilight Imperium theme isn't anywhere near as compelling for me personally as June is, it meant the game was not out of people's hearts and minds for 20 or 30 years, which it would have been otherwise. Moving on with the theme of negotiation, we come to my number two game, and this game's set in one of my favorite settings in all of board gaming, the Android universe. And that game is New Angeles. New Angeles is what I call a permission game. Nothing really happens without some form of agreement in this game. The core mechanics are, are relatively simple. There are regions in the city of New Angeles that you, the six different corporations, are contesting. Each of you wants to be the most profitable mega corporation in the city, and you might have a rival who you want to outperform, or simply just want to make more money than everyone else. One person might also have sold out the corporations to the federal government, but, but that's kind of secondary. Each turn, one player will put up a card which decides what the collective is going to do this turn. And then other players can put up another card against that. Eventually you'll have two potential ideas put on the table. And the other players who weren't involved in placing those get to vote with their influence on which one takes place. And this leads to crazy amounts of wheeling and dealing, uh, backstabbing, uh, finger pointing, and general mayhem and discord amongst the players. Because one person might be that traitor. And the traitor wants to sink the city and cause it to collapse. The wrinkle is, the person whose order is approved, gets a substantial bonus in the form of an asset card. So while people might put up really practical ideas, you don't necessarily want them getting more and more powerful. So sometimes you might have to vote for a compromise or a second solution because you don't want the person who's got the best card on the table 
getting yet more wealth because they could be your rival or you suspect they could be the traitor. So the whole game is this diplomatic back and forth of rivalries in the face of a common threat. So you can't let things go entirely to pot unless you're the traitor, but you really want to be outperforming everyone else. And the way to do that best is to be contributing to the city, but not contributing so well that you're miles ahead of everyone else because then they'll gang up on you. It's a delicate, intricately woven game that with the right group of players will be a fascinating and rewarding experience. And finally, the number one six player game on this list which takes a lot of the themes that I've explored in other games of trading, wheeling and dealing, and a lot of busyness going on, and that is Sidereal Confluence. Now I've heard of people playing this at nine players and that blows my mind how chaotic and crazy that game would be, but I think six is about the manageable level where there's enough interaction going on and enough chaos and enough potential for everyone to be able to make really good trades during the game. Now if you don't know much about Sidereal Confluence, I have done a video on it, but it's entirely a trading game between up to nine different alien races who have completely different strengths and weaknesses. Their economies are built very differently and you're all trying to work with each other to gain the maximum benefit for yourself to become the power that contributes most to the galactic society as a whole and you do that by trading cubes back and forth resource cubes and you can trade technologies you can trade anything in this game and because the races are so distinct and varied and their economies work so differently and they have different needs wants and production abilities you end up with these fascinatingly bizarre asymmetric trades with conditions like I'll oh, lend me five resources and I'll give you two a turn for the next four turns or I've got these amazing things that will produce a lot of resources for you but I can't run them myself so you have to trade them off me and give me something so you can run them and there's another race that produces specific resources that can be used for anything but they produce very few of them so these resources are worth substantially more than a standard resource of the same size and they have to turn those rare valuable resources into more plentiful resources so that they can run their generators and create more. It's entirely positive interactions. Next to nothing in the game is coerced. Uh, it's all trading, wheeling, dealing. It's high energy, high chatter, a back and forth mess of cubes flying back and forth and people going, oh, I don't know if that's, uh, don't know if that's a good deal. Uh, you wouldn't mind giving me an extra cube for that. And then you're looking around desperately for someone else who's got the same thing that this person's trying to stonewall you on. There's something profoundly unique about Sidereal Confluence. It's gameplay, how it makes you feel, and just the sheer madness and scale, complexity, and weirdness of the game. It's truly unique experience. If you've got six people, and they've got the time and inclination to learn a reasonably complex game that involves a hell of a lot of horse trading, yelling, and begging for cubes, I absolutely recommend giving Sidereal Confluence a go. All right, that's my top 10 list of games that are great at six players. Our long form videos like this are made possible through my Patreon supporters. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be doing these lists. And if you want to see more content like this, consider signing up on Patreon. Uh, we have cookies and stuff. And if you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe to the channel, and check out our Patreon.